This is episode number 14 with Dr. Nat Gringudis. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, habits, mindsets, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Nat Gringoudis is a doctor of Chinese medicine and acupuncture, natural fertility educator, and author. She's also the owner of The Pagoda Tree, a hub for natural fertility and women's health. Nat recognized a large gap between conventional medicine and supporting wellness and has developed a unique style of natural fertility integrating the Western medical approach with alternative therapies, Chinese medicine, and natural fertility methods. Nat has accepted the task of inspiring wellness, not only for those embarking on becoming parents, but equally important to her, educating young women on how their choices shape their reproductive health. She believes this is key to addressing the infertility epidemic. For Nat, fertility isn't just about making babies. It's about outstanding health. Her knowledge in fertility and natural medicine has been featured in many publications as well as various TV appearances as a wellness expert. Now, Nat and I hosted Health Talks TV together many years ago, and she is a very dear friend of mine. This woman is a wealth of knowledge, and I love her dearly. I cannot wait for you guys to hear this episode. Episode. In this episode, we chat about the repercussions of the pill, the common mistakes women make when it comes to the pill and your periods, the healthiest and natural alternatives to the pill, why the gut is the epicenter of happy hormones and humming health, how the pill affects your thyroid and what to do if you suspect you may have thyroid issues, PCOS, what it is and how to fix it, why fertility is so much more than just about making babies how stress affects your hormones, plus so much more. Everything that we mention, you can get in the show notes. All you have to do is head to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 14. I am so excited for you guys to dive into this episode with the one and only Dr. Nat Gringoudis. Welcome, beautiful Nat. Before we dive in, can you tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? I had beautiful tomato salad with basil and tomato and avocado and maple bacon. Oh my gosh, I am so jelly and coming over for breakfast. (laughs) I just wanted to share a little bit about my personal story first. So I was on the pill from 18 to 24, so that's seven years. And I came off the pill at 24 and I didn't get a period for about a year and a half. I was also vegan at the time, which may have complicated things, but this is something that is really common. What is going on? Oh, your story is completely common. And I think, first of all, when it's happening to you, you feel like you are the only person that it's happening to. So it can be completely frightening, you know, something that we freak out about. And it's also something that now it's a little bit more common, but I guess, and women are talking about it. But really, at the end of the day, the pill takes our hormones offline. And when we are on it, unfortunately, it does dip into our vitamin and mineral stores or it doesn't allow us to replenish our vitamin and mineral stores. But it also really has its way with our gut, which means that our gut's not functioning properly. Um, and, we, you know, I know you've you've dived into that area, so we don't need to go too far into that. But it really does upset the microbiome um, and therefore it becomes a, quite an issue. What I find with women also is that they might cycle along okay for a little while. They'll take the pill, they feel okay, and then all of a sudden the walls start to come crashing down. 
and they start to notice little symptoms that start to happen. Um, And these might lead them on a path of exploration, they might look into it or they might decide to come off because perhaps they they are bleeding a lot or whatever the signs and symptoms might be. But then when they come off the pill, generally one of two things happens. Either our bodies are all different um, and we find ourselves into this or fall into this overdrive state of too much estrogen because it's been so used to having all of this estrogen, all of a sudden your body goes, hang on a minute, I've got to go and make all of that. I've got to match that. Or because our gut is so deficient, and especially some women have been on the pill for 20 plus years, then we don't have the backbone to go and create healthy hormones. So we're operating out of a real place of deficiency. And that can be another reason why we're not seeing the period return. Now, when we dive into that, there can be so many things that are happening, PCOS or or uh, um, you know, low, like I said, low hormones. There's lots of things that can contribute, but they're the two main categories that I tend to see with patients in the clinic. My goodness. And what got you so fascinated in this in the beginning? Like, was it out of your own personal desperation? Usually that's where we all start, you know, facing adversity ourselves. But what was it for you? I finished university and I was at uni for a really long time. Um, I studied for 10 and a half years in total. And I got to the end of that and we were operating a very small clinic at the time. And I had this influx of women coming in with hormone problems, fertility issues, missing periods, you know, you name it, very much all of those things that fall into the women's health category. And I was not equipped to deal with it. I had no idea what to do with these women. And I made a very bold statement one day and I said to a friend, I am never treating women's health. They are too hard. It's too complicated. Let's face it. Not only are hormones tricky, these women are hormonal (laughs) and they're hard to deal with. And I I just don't have, I don't feel like I have the experience to, to deal with this. What I then went to realise was that there was nobody giving these women answers and there was nobody filling the gaps. And this is sort of, you know, 14 or so years ago. And so I, after many, many, many more women rocking up to my clinic asking for the same help, I realised that I needed to listen to what these women were asking for and find them some solutions because they weren't finding any. And there was a real turning point for me because up until that time I was very much didn't want to know about it and recognised that, well, actually this is what women need and this is an area that I can really help people with. And so it led me on a path of exploration and discovery. And that's that's how I landed here. Well, thank goodness you did, <laughs> sister. Thank the Lord. Because your work is so important, sweetie, and it's it's really needed. So thank goodness. Thank that you. You listened. Well, absolutely. And it's so the opposite of what I had in my mind that, you know, and I guess you would call it your mean girl was telling me, you know, what would you know? You don't know how to help these women. You haven't had babies. You haven't had issues with your period. Um, So how can you guide these women? But I guess the opposite of that is that I wasn't operating out of a place of deficiency or illness. I was actually operating from really healthy place, which allowed me to then learn and discover and be able to empower and educate other women in this area. Mm, And you now since then have had two gorgeous little monkeys. And um, so you now can speak from that place, which is really awesome. Totally. There's not many women that I meet along my journey who haven't had some complication and and been seriously confused when it comes to the pill, their periods, fertility. So can you tell us the top three mistakes when it comes to the pill and our periods? Many women go on the pill because they don't have a period. Or skin issues. Or skin issues, yep, absolutely. So they're using the pill as a treatment, not a contraception. And I guess that as a side benefit, it is a contraception, but they're using it um, to treat a problem. Now, the issue here is that it, it never has been, it never will be able to offer a treatment solution. It acts as a Band-Aid. It takes our hormones 
offline, we don't get that beautiful dance of our hormones each and every month. And it really stagnates things in the body. And that's very much a Chinese medicine term. But that you can imagine that that beautiful flow isn't there. Everything's kind of still and not, not moving in any direction. So I think one of the biggest mistakes women make first and foremost is that they are using it as a treatment and it doesn't actually do that. Then I think we're also led to believe that we're, there's a pill to fix it. So we take the pill because our doctors told us to, perhaps because we don't have a period or, like you said, we have acne. And we're also told that maybe if we don't have a period, don't worry, take the pill and when it's time for you to conceive, come back and see me and I'll give you another pill to fix that. (laughs) True, true, right? That doesn't work like that either. And I think a lot of women are discovering this, that they come off the pill only to discover that their skin is a 100 times worse or that they still don't have a period or... Let's list some of the things. Can we list some of the things that we take the pill for? Mm -hmm. We take the pill for acne. We take the pill for period pain, ovulation pain, heavy bleeding, no periods, PMS, anxiety, depression. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Contraception, yes. Um, You know, so many reasons why we're taking it. But who's actually looking at the root cause of these problems? Unfortunately, your doctor, most doctors, and things are changing, but they're the ones that are prescribing you the pill. They're not necessarily telling you all of this information, nor are they telling you the side effects. And that's not necessarily their fault. That's because that's what they're being told. So it, it's really difficult when we're getting so many mixed messages about, is it okay? Isn't it okay? And I guess for me, the proof's in the pudding. If you came and you sat and I invited you to sit in my clinic for the day and you saw first high, first, um, sorry, first hand, what these women are going through, you, you, you would be devastated. And mm. really the reality is it is causing a lot of long-term problems and that effect is passed on to our children. So, you know, think about you and you've got your eggs inside you, therefore it is affecting you and your eggs, which is your children. Um, and their eggs are inside that again. So, you know, it passed, it's, it's said to be passed on the effects of the pill and all synthetic hormones, we should say at this point, not just the pill, but we're talking about the marina, we're talking about the implanon. Any synthetic hormone is going to have an impact on our body. Now, that doesn't mean that we should operate out of a place of fear and all run out and stop taking the pill, but we need to know why we're taking it. And then we need to know, you know, is there a solution? other than the pill that's not going to have its way with my health and really weigh things up. There's no right way. We're not here saying don't do it. We're saying have some information. Does it resonate? What feels good? And then utilize that to guide you, not just out of a place of fear or perhaps operating out of it. Oh, well, there's no other solution. This is just what I have to do. So that's another mistake I think people make is that there's a magic bullet. Don't worry about it. We can just, you know, totally come back and and fix that. Um, when and when they're ready. Um, and I think the other the other thing, and I think it's in, we sort of mentioned that, is that we're not educated about it. So I've already said that, but you, you asked me for three things or three mistakes mm. people make. <laughs> so the third would be that we're not informed. We're, we're, and we do this with a lot of things. Um, we trust the health professional. And yes, they have our best interest at heart. But they're also operating from a place where they need to do what's best for the collective general public. And I would, I don't know about you, honey, but I'm not settling for being just one of many. I'm a unique individual and I need things to suit my needs, not what suits the collective community as such. And, and so I guess they're doing their part um, in that sense, but there's other, there's downsides to that as well. Mm. And I am a hundred percent in agreement with you that knowledge is key. Knowledge is power. Take what we're saying, take what every single person, every guest that I bring on this show, take what they say and then see how it feels for you. There is a front and a back to everything. And when we empower ourselves with the knowledge, we can then tune into ourselves and go, okay, cool. Well, I have the front and the back. I have the for and the against. Now what resonates and feels good for me? And then you can make an informed decision from that place. And that's what I never had. I only had one side of the story when I was 18 and first given the pill. I only had this one side and I didn't know 
all the repercussions of the pill and I didn't I didn't have this information at my hand but I now do and I can make this informed decision on what feels true and good for me and that's my wish for everyone I think too Mel the other thing is that we fear what we don't know so I'll use this, use the example I am not great with accounting <laughs> and I run three <laughs> businesses so you know that's not ideal but I every time my accountant rings I cringe I'm like oh what are they going to say I've done something else wrong I made it my absolute goal of 2017 to understand accounting in my business and remove that fear because I knew operating out of that place of fear was only feeding that bad boy and so we can do the same thing with our health now I get health so I get that that's not scary for me but it can be scary to other people so if you think about what you understand and what you know And it's just fact and it's just what is and it feels natural to you. And then think about what you fear and start to, you know, put this principle across the board. And it can just, just by being informed, you start to break down those walls of fear. And I think that's a beautiful place to be able to make informed choices and remove any of that negative association with change or different ideas or things. Mm. And one of the things that you mentioned before is that, I, like, you know, myself included in this category, one of the reasons I originally went on it was not only to fix acne and period pain, but the third reason for me was I didn't want to fall pregnant. Um, and that's for a lot of women. That's originally, you know, why they go on it. But what are the healthy alternatives for us ladies that don't want to put these synthetic hormones into our beautiful temples? You know, we're doing so much amazing work to nourish our bodies with beautiful foods and clean water and meditation and yoga. And then we go and dump this synthetic hormone into our system what are the alternatives? You know, I love this question because I think you're right. We do all of the other things and then we're like, oh, but there's still that factor. (laughs) I still haven't dealt with my contraception. I say always that the best gift that you can give yourself is understanding your body, understanding your cycle and your hormonal rhythms. It is without doubt the most empowering thing you can do as a woman. Now, the tricky part can be that if you've been on the pill or you've used some form of synthetic contraception, you might not even know what your rhythms are because you've never had the ability to know that. And so, you know, you might hear other women talk about mood changes or um little twinges or feeling really good at certain times of the month and you're like I just feel the same all month round but when you're not utilizing these synthetic um, chemicals or hormones in your body then again that beautiful dance plays out each month and it tells you so much information about you and your body and the thing I find the most mind-blowing about contraception is if you have a regular cycle and that's always our aim is that we want to move women back to that place of regular menstrual cycles, that's the way our bodies are designed to work, then you can start to understand your fertile times and your infertile times. And for most women who have a regular cycle, that will only be a couple of days each month. So I find it madness that we take something that flatlines our hormones all months round for the sake of a fertile window that's only a couple of days. If we can understand when those days are, then we can put necessary measures in place. But it's the most empowering thing. And and in doing that, you can understand, like I said, those rhythms. Am I ovulating in the middle of the month? Am I ovulating later? Do I have ovulation pain? Is there PMS? All of these things that we see as symptoms are just signs of a bigger issue that allow us to dig in and explore and treat the problem at hand. So coming back to understanding the menstrual cycle means that you're going to be able to work out when you might potentially fall pregnant and when you don't. So in terms of how to track that, there's many ways to do that. There's many fertility devices now available. And I love this because we're making it really simple to understand our rhythms. We've also got almost like a backup. You know, we've been looking at our cycles from from the beginning of time. I'm very sure women have always drawn upon 
the signs and symptoms that our body give us each and every month. But now we have little devices that actually help to confirm that for us. So we take a little bit of the guesswork out. And I know, you know, Mel, you advocate for natural cycles. Um, it's it's a temping or a temperature charting um, thermometer device. It has an app that goes with it. There's many of these and they are all um, in their own way excellent at doing that. So that would be my first option choice um obviously you know there's a few uh other methods barrier more barium type methods condoms um the cervical cap i love i think it's very easy to use it's not readily available is that available. like a diaphragm it's, except it's smaller so it can mm. be inserted up to around six hours prior to you know if you know you're going to have sex um it can be inserted earlier and it does but it's I think it's a little bit easier to use and it's it's smaller again so it just sits over the cervix um and I think that's a really good option but can I say if you are in, not in a relationship and really practicing sex we can't rely on the pill or any form of synthetic contraception it does not protect us from STDs and that to me is a really big issue totally they forgot to mention that in my sex ed class <laughs> they 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 did they you know i remember having one personal development class and in that class we learned they gave us a condom and they gave us a banana and we had to put i went to an all girls school and we had to put the condom on the banana and they said if you don't want to fall pregnant use this little did they mention and they mentioned nothing about stds nothing and these are with you for life Sure, you know, you could fall pregnant and whatever your choice from there um, is your choice. But, you know, these STDs are, are with you for life. And it's, it's you know, not something that you want to contact. So, yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that about the condoms. Um, and I just wanted to go back. You said before, wait, we can only fall pregnant a few days of the month? Okay, I don't think a lot of people know this. <laughs> well, yeah, technically, look, if you don't have a re- this is what we need to come back to. What is our body telling us? Now, our body can attempt to ovulate several times in a month. That doesn't mean it's a, a necessarily a, um, a successful attempt. So this is why it's important to track and chart and understand. Um, but in a healthy body that isn't you know, under immense stress, and we can talk about some of the things that might skew this, um, then yes, it's only, you know, your body should gear up, ovulate, get the job done and move on. It's either there's an egg to fertilize or there's nothing there to fertilize the egg. And it's as simple as that. Um, What can be daunting is that we're living at a time where stress is high and stress will be one thing that will impact ovulation. So let's say, you know, you're cycling along and you're on cycle day 10 and you're getting ready to ovulate and everything's happening and then you have a big stressful event go on. Your body is super clever. It just turns around and says, you know what, not today, Mel, not today. I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to let you deal with what has to be dealt with and I'm going to come back in several days and we're going to try again. And it can do that. But if you understand what your body is telling you, you will know it is doing that because you can watch how you're feeling, your cervical fluid, and if you're temping, it will show you in that as well. So there's many ways that we can know. And the more we watch our body rhythms, the more we're across this and the less Uh, unknown it becomes to us. We can really nail it. Look, put it this way. I have two beautiful children. They were conceived the month that I tried with both of them. I've been with my husband for 14 years. No other pregnancies. I've never been pregnant outside of that. I have never used synthetic contraception. I don't need to. I understand my body. And it's not scary. It just is. And you know what? I get really envious of those people that have accident pregnancies because I know that that I couldn't physically, like I would love a surprise. I'm like, oh, I'd love a surprise. That'd be so cute because I think I'm finished having babies now. That's probably the only way that I would have one. It's not going to happen because I know too much. And I know that, uh, of, you know, that that's not necessarily a possibility. Now, there are other theories, and it's probably important to mention that there are theories around other ways that your body might ovulate within a month. They're not proven and we don't know a lot about it. And so, I, you know, that's another whole podcast in, in itself, but I can direct people if they want to read more about that. But as we know it, you know, the way that your body works, you're only going to ovulate once in that month. Therefore, you are only going to be able to fall pregnant over that window of time. Mm. You know, understanding and really getting to know my own cycle 
is has been one of the most beautiful gifts I've given to myself. And it took me, like I mentioned before, it took me, you know, a year and a half before I even got a regular one. And then it, you know, it was like every two months and I would ovulate, but then, you know, all sorts of different things. But really charting and understanding and syncing my cycle to the moon cycle and really getting to understand my body has been such a beautiful journey. I now look forward to my cycle. I love seeing how my energy differs throughout the month, how my temperature differs, how, you know, I go through my own personal, I mean, we all do summer, autumn, winter, and spring in this one month. And I love doing that. And I love charting about it. That is something, you know, that I've been doing for the past four years. It's really empowering, isn't it? Mm, Really, really empowering. Yeah, and it's really empowering and it's almost like you're taking the control back because it's been a, such an unknown factor for many women for a really long time. And so it's one way that you can say, hey, I'm, in, I'm actually in control here. I can see what's happening. I don't need to rely on synthetic chemicals to do that job for me, if that's what you choose. And the other thing too is it can be sound really, the whole idea of charting for women can sound really time-consuming, something that maybe we don't necessarily have the ability to commit to, and that's a choice as well. I get that. But like we said, there's so many devices out there now that help us do that. It's as simple as taking your temperature before you get out of bed in the morning and that's it. And then you go on with your day and then, you know, all that information gets recorded. There's apps, there's all sorts of things to allow us to see that. And I use that as a diagnostic tool in my clinic as well. If I can watch somebody's chart, I can know so much about them and what's going on with their body. It truly is an amazing gift. Mm. What are some of your favorite apps? I mean, like we mentioned before, and we can put all of these in the show notes, but I just wanted to give um, everyone some places to start. Like I I love natural cycles and period tracker, but there's also, um, is it Clue? Yeah, there's heaps. There's Clue, there's the Daisy, um, there's uh, what's the other one? Indara, Indara, I think it's called. Um, yeah, Kindara, Kindara. Um, there's lots. I, as an app and an app alone, I love M Cycles. So it's just M dot Cycles. Um, it allows you to really track your symptoms, and I'm actually very for symptoms because not everybody has a stable body temperature, and that's again telling you something as well. So it can be sometimes good to invest in allowing someone to help you understand at least for the first couple of months your cycle and then, you know, you continue on your merry way. But there are heaps of, of apps and devices that, that allow you to do this with and make it really effortless and take the guesswork out. Mm, so good. I love it. And mm. I actually really love recording it. Like when when you can click on the little period started today and period ends today and what's my mood and what's my energy and, you know, did I make love today? Like I love charting it all. Like it's really fun and they make it really colorful and easy. But another thing that you mentioned and that I do is use condoms occasionally. But do you know what I recently discovered is that a lot of the condoms that we buy over the counter have highly toxic spermicide chemicals in them, which are going right up inside us. That's the thing. We need to then explore and drill down and look at what our options are. And we could have a whole, I mean, I've, I've met people that are in this industry of, you know, looking at even, um, sex toys that also have the same problems and they're made out of plastics and we're utilizing them and there's actually there's online um there's online stores that that deliver natural versions of these things so there's options we need to know that there's options and look at the best option for us so yeah it's not just limited to um to condoms it's you know it's anything that goes towards our most intimate parts of our body we need to realize that the plastics play a really big role and that can be nasty. So yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. One brand that I've discovered is called Glide and it is a natural latex that has no spermicide. They are a little bit more expensive, but, um, you know, do you want a side of spermicide with your condom or do you not? (laughs) It's, it's up to you. I mean, I know which I choose. Exactly. Exactly. And then I should mention, and I get in a bit of trouble for this, but 
this is my research, is that withdrawal is actually um, very effective if it's done properly. And again, you'd want to practice that with a long-term partner because it's not protecting you necessarily from STDs. But the research indicates that there is no live sperm in pre-ejaculatory fluid and that as long as your partner withdraws, obviously, prior to ejaculation. And then if you were to have sex again, um, your partner just needs to urinate in between before having sex again to make sure that, that that's flushed. And that is up somewhere around, oh, don't fully quote me, but it's in the 90% effective. I want to say like 94% effective. That's the other thing that we haven't mentioned, that we're told statistics about the pill and other forms of synthetic contraception being around 99% effective. Um, they fail. Um, and they're not necessarily as effective as we're led to believe. But I tell you what, um, research indicates that these methods that we're talking about, natural fertility awareness, which is what we've been speaking about, charting and whatnot, is around 99.7% effective. Walza. Yep. True. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Exactly. You know, nothing is 100% effective. Nothing is. But if it's done properly, yeah, it's very effective. Wow. Now, I know you're the right person to ask this next question because you have a program called Debunking Your Thyroid. Can we talk about thyroid and weight gain and the connection between thyroid issues and the pill? Yes. So your thyroid is like your internal thermostat. It's a gland that sits at the base of your neck. It looks like a butterfly. Um, every single cell in your body requires your thyroid to work. And it's not like there's other hormones that are secreted in our body, um, things like glucose, for example. If it's secreted in, in varying amounts, so long as it's within a relatively normal range, we don't feel the effects of that. But your thyroid hormones are uh, circulated in such small amounts and have the most profound effect on every single part of your body that if it's just a little bit out of kilter, the symptoms are so obvious that you know something is wrong. The other issue is that, that women often are sort of getting clued up on this and saying, oh, I think there's something wrong with my thyroid, yet they're going to their GP or their doctor and their test results are coming back normal. And we can talk about why that's happening in a second. But when it comes to the pill and thyroid and weight gain, remember that the pill upsets your gut. That's bottom line. The pill upsets your gut. If your gut can't facilitate from a nutrient perspective what your thyroid needs, then your thyroid's not going to work properly. And one of the side effects of that is going to be weight gain. So in the most basic sense, the pill will do that because of the thyroid is the symptom in this instance, not the cause. The cause is the gut health. Does that make sense? Mm, absolutely. Yep. Mm. So it's really interesting. Thyroid is a tricky one, but you know, coming back to what I was saying before, let's talk about some thyroid symptoms. Um, fatigue, um, headaches, weight gain, cold hands and feet, not sleeping at night, um, just low energy, foggy brain. There's so many symptoms. Um, and the problem is that the reference ranges that we test for the thyroid, we test for something called TSH. It's, that's our thyroid stimulating hormone. And in 2003, the reference ranges, so you know the ranges you see on your test results, those ranges were from 0.5 to 5. In 2003, those reference ranges were changed to sit somewhere between 0.3 and 3. Now, here's the problem. Not all path labs report the new reference ranges and not all doctors are aware that the reference ranges have changed, even though that's what, 14 years ago that they've changed, we're still using old measurements to measure TSH. This is why so many people have an undiagnosed thyroid issue and why they might go to their doctor and they're not getting the true answers that they need. Oh, that's full on. Mm, isn't it? <laughs> it makes me sad. I know, but if you know that, then, mm. you, you know, you are the best person to advocate for what you need. So just knowing that alone means if you have a thyroid or you suspect you have a thyroid issue and you've been to your doctor and they've said, no, no, you're all good, you're within those reference ranges, it means you take a copy of your results and have a look and see where is your TSH at because I want your TSH to sit somewhere around one. That's very different from it sitting somewhere up near five and still being told that you are normal or that you're functioning at a normal capacity. You're not. So the thyroid again, however, and food is always medicine. How can we use our diet, our lifestyle, our environment 
to take our health in the right direction. And previously we were told we needed to be medicated when it came to our thyroid. That was the only solution. And I'm here to say that is not the solution at all. And it might offer some short-term relief and help and it might be very necessary, but we've got to look at why the thyroid's doing that in the first place. There's always a reason. Mm, And I love that you take a very holistic approach and you look at your diet, your lifestyle, everything, and you take all of that into consideration because it all matters, doesn't it? Absolutely. And there's research around thyroid that if people just remove gluten who are um, experiencing thyroid issues, 20% of them, their symptoms will disappear. So again, I have issues with that, even though that's amazing, you're just removing the driver of the problem. The gut is still compromised. It's still not able to process properly. And yes, granted, gluten isn't really something that everybody should be having necessarily, not in its its most refined form, but you should also be able to live from a place where you can have little amounts of anything from nature and you are okay with that as a small amount. Gluten is a bit of a tricky one because it doesn't resemble gluten anymore it's genetically modified and whatever else so it's always about coming back and going okay well I've removed the gluten so I've removed the driver that's going to be the hurdle that's going to stop my gut from healing but now I need to heal my gut and I need to get the nutrients available so that my thyroid can then operate properly as well Mm, everything starts in the gut doesn't it does everything everything starts there So let's role play for a minute. Um, I'm a young girl and I've been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years and it's just not happening for me. So I go to my doctor and I find out I have polycystic ovaries. What do I do? First of all, you need to know you're like around 25% of the population. Um, And then secondly, it's really important. There's a lot of new research out around PCOS, which is very exciting because PCOS has changed as we know it. We used to just think that the only reason PCOS happened is because we had too much male hormone in the body. We now know that there's other factors that can play in and the symptoms are actually changing. So what do I mean by that? Perhaps you've been a very active teenager and you never got a period. And then, you know, you're 24 and you're exploring why that might be. And then you're told you have PCOS, but you're not overweight. You don't have acne. You don't have facial hair. You're just lean and you don't have a period. So it's very different from traditionally what we diagnose someone with PCOS as of being overweight, acne, facial hair, all of those things that we just mentioned. There's various categories now, and that allows us to then know how to treat it, which is very exciting. Now, if you are that traditional form of PCOS, we need to look at, okay, well, why is the body doing that? Because there's always a reason. And we know it's too much testosterone generally in the body. So my first two points of call are, you're going to guess what the first one is, gut health. (laughs) Because if we can't facilitate the body with the nutrients, then we're not going to make the hormones properly. Our body's not going to function properly and we're operating from that place of deficiency. So we must start there. But then we need to add on. There's a couple of other places to look. And generally as a practitioner, I'll then look at liver health because the liver has several detoxification pathways it's responsible for. And one of them is converting healthy testosterone and estrogen. And if it's not doing that, it's going to add to the estrogen pile, which is going to add to the excess testosterone in the body as well. Inadvertently, it's, it's a, you know, we're not going to get into the science of it. But if we can maximize liver function and we can minimize estrogen in the body, it's going to allow the body to function better and these PCOS symptoms will start to dissipate, meaning that the body's once again operating properly. Now, why you get PCOS is also very important to understand. You will get PCOS if that is what you're predisposed to. Your genetics determine what you are predisposed to. It could be endometriosis, it could be PCOS, it could be eczema, psoriasis, arthritis, These autoimmune conditions, they're in our DNA. We can't change that. But what we can change is the way that our genes operate in our body and make them work to the best of their ability, which is going to mean that these symptoms aren't turned on and therefore they're not going to be a problem. So that's what it all comes down to, looking at what am I predisposed to and how can I make my genes behave in the right way? And that all comes down to cellular function. How can I make my cells behave properly? And that's what I'm talking about here, gut, liver, and then a few other things, um, drilling down again, depending on what the patient is presenting with. But if you have PCOS and you don't know where to start, they're the two places that we can start. Mm, That's really helpful. (laughs) 
it's a lot of information and it can be really overwhelming and I understand that. So really, if you're lost, come back to gut health. Start there. Mm. It's so important, isn't it? It really is the epicenter of everything. We could do an entire episode on fertility and maybe we should another time. But something I hear all the time is, oh, I don't need to worry about fertility. I don't want to get pregnant or it doesn't matter that I don't have a period because I don't want to make babies. So tell us why being fabulously fertile is so important, not just if you want to make babies. Yeah. I mean, okay, here's the thing. Do you want to be healthy? That's what it comes down to to me. It, it not, It's not like a a switch that we can flick on when we're ready. And this is, you know, long been a, a caption that I've used is that fertility isn't about babies. Fertility is about being the best version of you, thriving, and if and when you're ready to conceive, you are ready to go. You don't need to go and do all of this groundwork to get yourself there. Because really, if you're not operating from a state of fertility, then you don't actually have a, a state of great health. And it's just a reflection of how healthy you are. So it is, you know, we don't just leave soil and then one day plant a seed and then hope for the best. We nurture the soil, we feed it, it needs sunlight, it needs nutrients, it needs all of these things so that then if we're ready and we want to plant a seed, it it will grow. And it's the same thing when it comes to our bodies. So fertility isn't just about babies, it's about having thriving hormones. How do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Are you bright eyed? Do you, is your menstrual cycle regular? Do you sleep well? Like your sex hormones are responsible for so much more than just a period. So if you don't have a period and you're not fertile, you're not operating at your best. That's what it comes down to. And I can guarantee you, if you start to sort these things out, you will not only feel much better, but you'll set yourself up for long-term health. And I think we've got to look at the bigger picture because sure, we know there's certain times in our lives when we don't want babies, but moving forward and always thinking ahead, do I want to feel horrible when I'm 35? Do I want to go through early menopause and then that be a process that takes me 10 years to get through? No, thanks. You know, it's supposed to be a transition, not an illness. So, We've got to think, and I know none of us are thinking about menopause. It sounds morbid and horrible, but we've got to think long term. And, you know, those women that transfer trans, um, through those later years with ease, they've got it all going on. Like you've seen some of these women. There's some that you just look at them and they might be 55 and they look like they're 40 and they're glowing and they're amazing. And I want to be that woman when I'm that, that age. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to be barren and feel horrible and gain weight. That's a really common symptom as we get older is that we gain weight. And again, it's not the problem. It's the symptom of the problem. Is it the thyroid? Is it the adrenals? Is it the gut? Whatever it is still links back to us being fabulously fertile. So just we have to open up our minds around the word fertility, I believe, and look at it as the bigger picture, not just in this minute going, oh, well, I'm really happy not to have a period. And if I can add, a lot of women are happy to not have a period because their periods are horrible and they dread it. And again, there's a, of course, I don't blame you, but let's fix that because it's so treatable and that's going to allow you to feel better in general as well. That was definitely me in my younger years. I used to experience excruciating pain to the point where I would vomit or faint and have to have a day off school and I would, you know, down it with painkillers. And when I started stopped getting my period, it was a relief. I was like, yay, don't have to deal with this anymore. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, now mine comes and goes in four days. Sure, on my first day, I, I feel definitely, you know, a bit more tired and lack of energy. And I feel, I can feel my ov ovaries ovulating um, and feel a little bit swollen, maybe a little tiny bit of back pain. But Gone are the days where I would be crippled over in agony and it doesn't have to be that way. No, it doesn't. And like I said, it's just, it's using that as your superpower. 
you know that on those days you go inward and that's normal. And I think what we do is on those days we try and push through and we try and be superhuman. I must get to the gym or I must, you know, do all of the project management or whatever and it's okay to have a couple of days offline every month. And if we can use that as our superpower, it means that then once we transition into the next phase of our cycle, we are a force to be reckoned with. We are on, baby. We can do whatever we want and do it really well. So it's using that to be productive in other areas as well. On the first day of my moon cycle, every month I have the day off. I have a bath. I lay in bed. I watch sex in the city. I just allow myself to do whatever I feel to do. I might go for a walk, but usually it's just rest. I lay in bed with my legs up the wall or I lay with a hot water bottle on my, on my belly on the couch with herbal tea. And I don't feel guilty about it anymore. I used to. And I'm a very driven, go, 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 type A personality. So for me, it was really challenging for me to stop on this day and just allow myself to just be. But over the years, I've seen the effects of pushing through that first day and it's just not worth it. You know, we would never have pushed through that first day back, you know, thousands of years ago. We would have really allowed ourselves to rest. We would have gone to the red tent and, you know, had other women support us and look after us. But, you know, we don't have to push through. 100%. Agreed. So I would like to know what is one thing that you would like to improve or you're working on within yourself at the moment? Is there anything that you're currently dealing with or exploring within yourself? I find stress a constant thing that I need to be reassessing and which is special because I have e-courses and, you know, information everywhere about stress and stress management. But I do that because it's a challenge for me as well. So a lot of the information I share is because I'm in the same place as everybody else. And it's something that is very difficult to manage. And, you know, throw in a couple of businesses and a couple of kids and a husband to the mix and you know none of us are exempt from that so I guess that's something that I'm always working on and some days it gets the better of me yesterday was one of those days I had a meltdown and uh, you know one of those really honest I'm overcommitted and why do I do this to myself for so I need to get better at that and I'm constantly assessing that and some days I rock it and other days I really don't get do it well at all. Well, I can vouch for everyone listening. You're, we're all in the same boat. (laughs) You know, we've all, we've all got, we all have, you know, stress in our life and it's something that we just need to manage and deal with. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But I think Mm. we can't glorify it. We have to identify it and make better choices. And it's not a badge of honor to be stressed. It's in fact, it makes me cringe and I I get really cross with myself for allowing it to get to that point. Um, But sometimes you have to have the turning point. You have to have the meltdown to create a new way and that's okay. Yeah. I think, is it Tony Robbins who says you've got to have the breakdown to have the breakthrough? breakthrough. Yes. Yes, (laughs) definitely. (laughs) So let's pretend you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. Now, besides your amazing books, which you have many, and we'll put them all in the show notes, we'll link to them so everyone can go and find all of your books. What book would you choose to go in the school curriculum for every single high school student around the world? Can I choose two? Yes. Okay, Pam Grout's books, E squared, E cubed, life-changing and, you know, just exercises to turn on the magic. I love it. I said to my daughter the other day, Livia, you know you can make magic happen in your life. And she was like, what, mummy? And I said, if you, you can magic something to happen. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, well, you think about what you want and then we work out how you get it. And she's like, okay. I said, I, she was very upset. She had never won an award at school. And I said to her, all right, well, you're going to be the next person to win the award. And she's like, okay. I said, let's make that happen. Let's make, let's make magic happen. So anyway, Long story short, obviously I shifted her focus towards that and she won the award at the next week's um, school assembly. 
And she's like, mummy, we magicked it to happen. Oh, and it's so just beautiful. powerful. It's just, yeah, I know it's so, but you know what? We don't operate out of that place innately. Most of us don't anyway. So it's just little tools and the science behind it. And then everyone, Mel, I think everybody, um, especially teenage girls, should have access to Mastering Your Mean Girl. Just saying. Oh, oh my God, I got full body goosebumps. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so beautiful. Thank you, darling. Pleasure. <laughs> yeah, it's really important. We tell Leo about manifesting and we talk to him about that all the time. And, you know, we say the same thing to him. We say, you can manifest whatever it is that you truly desire. And it's not just about going, I want this and then sitting back and waiting for it to be handed to you on a silver platter. It's about, okay, well, what do you want? And what steps are you going to put in place to make that happen? It's not just about sitting back. So I love the saying, we magicked it. I'm going to steal that with Magic it. That with yeah, you. we magicked it. She, yeah, because it resonates with a little kid too. Like Libby's like, and then she'll say to me, sometimes she'll come to me and tell me what she's magicked for the day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I you. just love it. And I know it's so powerful and it's so, you know, what can it can look like, you know, especially with social media and everything else going on, that people are lucky and they're the lucky ones. And no, they're not. They just know how to manipulate the energy to what they want it, you know, the outcome. And You've got to truly operate, though, from that place. And, and I'm good sometimes at it and I'm not so good at other times. So, again, it's just practicing that muscle. So true. I used to think some people were just luckier than others or they were, you know, blessed or born into a rich family or, you know, I would look at these people and go, oh, well, it's easy for them. And I realized, you know, with age that that isn't the case. These women that I admire and look up to, like yourself included, like, you know, you work your butt off and you do it with love and you do it with as much grace as you possibly can, but you keep showing up. And that's what I realized with all of these amazing and inspiring, successful people that I have been exposed to is that they have worked their buns off. Thank you, but totally agree. Um, it, yeah, it, nothing just gets handed to any of us on a silver platter. It really doesn't. And, you know, if you don't have the drive to, to magic it, <laughs> nothing's mm. going to happen even if it was handed to you on a silver platter. So I think we've got to constantly, like you said, show up, reassess, you know, and the, the, the same things will keep on showing up for us until we learn the lesson as well. Flip it over and go, okay, you know, I've had several years of terrible business because I was trying to be taught a lesson. I really believe that. And it wasn't till it actually slapped me in the face that many times. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I've got to do something different, you know? So I think things will keep on showing up until we actually get it, deal with it, move past it. Mm -hmm. Health included. Absolutely. Health is a priority. Mm -hmm. So let's look at your day and talk about your day, in particular, your morning routine. I am obsessed with learning about how people that I love and admire prime themselves for the day. So can you talk us through some of your daily or morning non-negotiables that you perform each day? Yes. So obviously I'm a mum of two kids. Olivia is nearly nine and Geordie is five. And so my day can start in the way that I would like it to, but equally it can start in a day that they would like it to. And I'm not always um, able to dictate that because kids have different needs, they wake at different times. So if I get the ability to make it work my day, my morning routine is very loose. My evening routine is where I make up for it. But I will say this, if I can get up before the children and I can get in a really short session of mindfulness or meditation or just sitting in it or whatever I need to do and just sit there, that will be my first thing. That will be my priority. Now, sometimes the kids wake me up before I wake up and that's okay. And I think it's about being a little bit adaptable and a bit fluid. And if we get stuck in the rut of a routine that isn't doesn't have that, especially as a parent, I think that can set us up for failure. So I think we've got to be a little bit adaptable in this. And then, of course, once that's happened, I'll go through the motions and I love to be ready before the kids wake up. If I can go and get ready, I can go and have my, you know, shower and do my makeup and whatever else needs to happen, get them sorted, get their lunches ready. Basically, then it becomes all about them as long as there's nourishment somewhere in there. And some days are easier than others. Some days I'll be able to have 
sit down and have a full breakfast with them. Some days it'll be a matter of throwing everything into a smoothie and, you know, hoping for the best and that's okay. Um, Then my day, I get to work. I do what I need to do at work. Non-negotiable is nourishment and water um, and and just making sure that I am not overextending myself and not running from place to place. But if you want to fast forward to my nighttime routine, that's usually where I'll sit and I'll write for a bit um, each night because I love to do that and I don't see that as a chore. Um, Again, I'll read. That's another thing I love to do before I go to bed. But something I've recently started is each and every night writing down three things that I'm grateful for before I go to bed and then writing down three ideas that I have that I want to action tomorrow because minds can be busy at night time if we haven't wound down properly. So I'll always have a shower and then I'll go and do that and then I'll hop into bed. But one thing I'm very strict on doing is also leaving my phone away so I'm not getting that light hitting my eyes that's going to disrupt my hormones as well. Mm, Very important. So what are three things you are grateful for right now? Oh, I'm grateful always for health. I'm very grateful for the health of my family. Um, It is, you can't buy it. Um, it, It's, it's, you know, you can't put a price on it. And I know we haven't spoken about this, but I have, Geordie has a genetic condition. So it's been the one thing that is a constant reminder for us that I don't care if all the other walls are falling down. We always have our health and I think that I am extremely grateful for. Um, I'm also grateful to be in this this space to educate people and that, you know, alongside my loved ones and family, I am so grateful for women. (laughs) Um, And I think being able to operate from a place of influence for women and with a, a feminine energy, I'm really grateful for that. That is something that it's taken me a long time to Um, I guess establish but recognize as well. I used to think I was doing it wrong. I used to think, oh gosh, you know, I have to, we have to lead from this masculine place. And and it wasn't until I realized, no, drop into what you know, and you're a woman and you need to operate from that place. That's been really powerful. And I'm actually really grateful. We've just been through two floods. I'm really grateful for, um, what's the opposite of flood? (laughs) A dry surface in my house. (laughs) We've, we've had two major floods in two different o- occupancies and, oh, my goodness, I'm so grateful that that's fixed. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, not nice that you have had floods but nice that they've been fixed. No, but you know what, Mel, we always come back to we have our health. <laughs> no matter what happens, I'm always like, oh, it's okay, we've got our health kids to worry about it. Like they must just think I'm crazy because I don't know that they have that concept and awareness. But uh, like I said, I always bring it back to that. Well, if you don't have that, you can't do the things that you want to do. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I just, yeah, I think we take it for granted. I think we, we think there's a magic pill to fix it. We don't, impact, don't understand the impact that life may have on our health. Um, and I really think that that's, if we can start to really grasp that, that's a game changer. Mm, I agree. Now, I've got three rapid fire questions for you. What is one of the most important things that we can do for our health? We've spoken about gut a lot, I think, and we've established it's the epicenter. Chinese medicine has long advocated for this. So I think that is first and foremost where we must start and we have to do that. Um, We can't skimp on that and we can't compromise. Um, If I had to say something outside of that, I would say the next thing that we need to focus on is rest and sleep and doing less to do more. I love that idea that when we're on and we're firing and we're charging, then, then, you know, things just work. So I would say those two things. Awesome. Now, what's one of the most important things that we can do for our wealth? I think set goals. I think, again, and it, this comes to our health as well, setting goals. We don't generally do that. But I think we need to know where we're headed and it can be – you know, one of those things that we fear. And again, sometimes when it comes to me back to that example of the accountant, I think that if we have a clear picture of where we're heading, when, you know, those that plan succeed. So I think we need to have a clear, and it doesn't have to be, wealth isn't just money, right? It's all of the other things that go with it, but we still need to be able to put food on the table and pay the electricity bills. So I think mapping it out and knowing where you're positioned is really important. And what is one of the most important things that you can do for love in your life? Oh, I think love to me is my ultimate 
you know, um, when I have to think of a word, I usually have a word of the year that we intertwine and always comes back to love. And I think when there is love, there's not room for anything else. And it, it must come back to that. So loving ourselves, loving those around us, loving the bits that we don't love, you know, I think that is so powerful. So when it comes to love, it's almost like my word. And I just constantly think, how can I how can I approach something from love? And I think operating from that place again is really beautiful. You know, we're always going to have the sticky or the tricky conversations. We're always going to have, um, or potentially there's going to be conflict again. How can I operate? How can I answer? How can I listen from that place with love as the intention? Mm, love that. That's definitely one of my intentions too. So, um, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I would love to because I know all of the information that we talk about, it's overwhelming. There's a lot and it's sort of like, oh, you know what, I'm on the pill, what do I do? Do I stop taking it now? No, you just gather information, listen to what resonates like you said, Mel, and really if you need more answers, there's a lot of information out there about, about you know, the long-term effects. So understanding and just bringing it back to that. But again, let's not approach it from a place of fear let's just use it to get motivated and you know perhaps the idea might be completely off the radar you're like I cannot do that right now but what can you do if you're taking the pill okay how can you support your gut health so at least you're doing something proactive to support your body all the while taking it and I'll say that you won't necessarily get this as quick results or the long-term results, but you're still doing something proactive to take your body in the right direction. And I think if we can always have that eye on the prize of where we want to go, not where we don't want to go. So health and ease, let's say, being our ultimate, not sickness and fear, how can we change the track? How can we come always back over to health and ease rather than operating out of fear and, and stress? And I think that can be a takeaway for those that are on the pill and it's not an option yet to come off. And you are a hub of amazing information and resources. So we will link back to all of your amazing products and website in the show notes. So um, everyone can go and check out all your awesomeness. Amazing. But before we go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here and giving so much love and knowledge and wisdom. I am so grateful to have you in my life and have you as one of my beautiful dear friends. And, you know, we have been friends for so long now and I just have loved watching all the women that you've helped and inspired. And it's been a beautiful journey to witness. And I'm just so grateful for all the love and support that you give me and just to have you in my life. I'm I'm deeply grateful. Oh, thanks, Mel. You know what? Likewise. And you know the other thing? How many women we've helped together as a team? I have a lot of women that come to me and they say, you know what, I'm watching, uh, you know, I've 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 spent some time, I've I've really dug into what Mel teaches and I've dug in and and we make babies together, babe. You know that? <laughs> we have helped people, you know, overcome all sorts of things. So thank you equally because I think when you can pull your cheerleader or your squad, I call it your squad, pull those people that resonate with you, pull them all together and they're on the sideline cheering for you and your health. That's when the magic happens and that's what we're here to do and that's definitely what you're doing. So keep being awesome, babe. Oh, thank you so much, gorgeous. I'm really honoured. Isn't she amazing? I love that woman so much and I could chat to her for hours. She's just so full of knowledge and wisdom. I think it's fascinating that you can only fall pregnant a few days in the month. I don't think a lot of people know that, but it's just so fascinating. I also think it's really fascinating, the concept of the pill taking your hormones offline. I think that's really, really interesting. So I got so much out of that talk and I hope you did too. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and leave me a five-star review because that means we can get more awesome, amazing, inspiring people on this show. And don't forget to tell me who you want me to interview on the show. And you can do that on Twitter by tagging me at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that Nat and I mentioned in this episode, you can get 
all of the information in the show notes. All you have to do is head to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 14. You can also check out all my other podcasts there. All you have to do is go to melissaambrosini.com forward slash podcast. Thank you so much for being here and for wanting to be the best version of yourself and for showing up for you. You seriously rock. Now, if there's someone in your life that you know would get so much out of this episode, please share it with them right now. And until next time, don't forget that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.